Turn your Bibles to First uh, Kings chapter five as we continue our journey through the Old Testament on Sunday evenings. First Kings chapter five. And the title of this next message will be on preparations for building the temple. Now, as you remember last time, how Solomon has firmly been established as the next king of Israel. He's a young man at this point. He is 24 years old or so, from what many sources tell us, and thus he's uh, pretty much overwhelmed with the responsibility. And one night, as you remember, that Solomon was down in Gibeon, and the Lord appeared to him in a dream, and the Lord spoke to him and asked him, um, ask, what shall I give you? And uh, out of all the things that Solomon could have asked for, he asked for wisdom to rule. Uh, and again, he could have asked for anything, and it was wisdom to understand what is right, what is wrong, what is evil, what is good, to be able to discern. And that's the best um, prayer, and that's the best thing that you could ask for. And so the Lord was pleased with what Solomon asked for, and not only gave him that, but also blessed him with all the different material blessings as well. Now, as we move into chapter 5, we're going to see Solomon's going to gather all this material for the temple uh, to build it, uh, to make the central place of worship. And uh, as we'll see, Solomon's kingdom had peace and it also had prosperity. And as such, Solomon sets out to build the temple. And although David had a desire to build a temple for the Lord, uh, Solomon's the one that carries it out. And as we're going to see, the first half of this chapter in chapter 5 is really going to summarize the correspondence between Solomon and Haram, uh, the king of Tyre, uh, whom Solomon wants to buy the timber from, uh, the materials for building the temple by, uh, you know, this particular agreement that they're going to make. The next half of the chapter talks and explains about the results of such conversations and how he secures uh, the needed labor force for it. And as we'll see, the, the, the chapters, it um, um, deals with the constructions, um, the detailed plans, the labors, the dimensions, the materials, the furnishings, uh, so much so that it's possibly become so immersed into the details, you, you fail to see the larger picture of it all. Uh, but it is amazing to see all the things that go into this. And uh, one of the major aspects of the larger um, picture um, emerges in this chapter. As we said, this is kind of like the nuts and bolts, if you will, of uh, the, the, the chapter and, and of the building of the temple. So with that said, let's dive into our study. Verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, Now Haram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon, because he had heard that they had anointed him king in the place of his father, for Haram had always loved David. Now, as you re may remember, uh, that Haram was a friend of David. Uh, in fact, according to Second uh, Samuel chapter 5, verse 11, we're told that Haram, the king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and the cedars and the carpenters and the masons, and they built David a house. So they had this relationship. And that friendship extended on to Solomon, who is now king of Israel, and, and uh, he's prospering even more than David. And as we see here, the, the writer describes this long-standing relationship between Haram, uh, uh, king of Tyre, and David. Tyre, by the way, is the uh, capital of the Phoenician kingdom located on the east coast, or yeah, on the uh, coast of the Mediterranean, um, on the western side, of course, uh, and the, it borders this, um, Israel uh, on the north. And Tyre is in what is modern-day Lebanon. So if you want to know where Tyre is, it's modern-day Lebanon. And in ancient Near East at that time, Tyre was an ally of Israel. Uh, they maintained good relationships with Israel. Much different today because you have Hezbollah there, and they're trying to annihilate uh, Israel. So radically different uh, times. It was also customary uh, practice at that time during... Um, with the, when the new king became into power, the treaties, uh, they expired after the, the death of uh, either party, whether it's the uh, w whatever country you're working with. And so they would often do this to uh, realign their treaties and their um, you know, alliances. And so after hearing of David's death, Solomon enthroned, uh, Haram sends an envoy to Solomon 
to find out if it's a, a good relationship uh, between the two. And so Hiram wanted to know more about this new king, to build a relationship with him, his plans for peace, or is it going to be for war, uh, as well as his wisdom, because he's heard uh, people are coming from afar to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now, verse 2 goes on to say, Then Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, You know my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God, because all the wars which were fought against him on every side, until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on either every side, and there is neither adversary nor evil occurrences. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, and whom I set on your throne in your place, shall build a house for my name. Now therefore command that they cut down cedars for me from Lebanon, and my servants will be your servants, and I will pay uh, you wages for your servants according to whatever you say. For you know that there is none among us who has the skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. So as we see here, he sends this message to Hiram, uh, his plans to build the temple, explaining uh, the rationale for such this huge project. Uh, his message, he identifies three um, convincing reasons why they need to build the temple. One of them is that because David couldn't build it. That was reason number one. Uh, Solomon says David could not build the temple, although he wanted to, but because of all the fights uh, and, and the, the wars that he was fighting uh, with as well. So that was part of it. And again, he was a man of war, a man of blood, all these other uh, components to it as well. But David wanted to have a permanent place, a, a center of worship in the capital, uh, in the kingdom. Uh, and, and because of Deuteronomic law, and Deuteronomy 12 kind of talks about this as well. For David, building the temple ensured that the Lord's uh, or, or Yahweh's presence uh, is, uh, is going to be there. And it would earn God's blessing for the nation. So uh, he was honoring the Lord there. And so the temple would be a center for worship, for prayer, for offering sacrifices, uh, a storehouse for the Ark of the Covenant. Instead of uh, the tabernacle as it was in the past, it was moved around from place to place. And those who lived in different regions in the nation can now be united by this central um, sanctuary, uh, even though that they worshiped in their own little sanctuaries as well in other locations. But this is going to be the main center uh, for the nation to come. Uh, David, as we know, has, uh, was not able to build the temple because of all his energy and the resources had been spent fighting against his enemies, protecting Israel from uh, the attacks. Now, there's a phrase that um, is mentioned here is that he's um, um, the name of my God. So he wants to build the temple in the name of my God. So when all the nations uh, around Israel built temples, they were designed literally to house the gods that they believed in. And that's the way a lot of the pagans do it today. These are pagan worship. You have all these different idols there. And by uh, Solomon emphasizing the name my God, he's, uh, he's teaching this king cannot fit, you know, that God cannot really fit into the, the temple. Uh, he's too big of a God. His presence is everywhere. Uh, and so Solomon's teaching that, um, that God is the God. You know, he is not just one of many gods. He is God. And so the purpose of this temple was for the Israelites, like we said, to go to worship the Lord, uh, not a place for God to actually dwell in, which was the, uh, what all the other religions were trying to do. And notice how Solomon, like his father, uh, was being a witness to this powerful king in Tyre uh, and trying to share uh, what God is about. And so as we see with Solomon trying to, um, you know, the same diplomacy through um, the, the messenger. So they're going back and forth here. Solomon's laying out for the king the whole story, how God spoke to David, how a son would rule from the temp rule, and, and also he was going to build the temple. And so... With all that stated, again, the main point here is that Solomon is establishing a relationship with the king of Tyre. And the point of this relationship is that Solomon wants to pay the king so that the trees from that area would be cut down and used to build his temple. That's a big ask. You could have, why couldn't you just build from the, the trees that are there in Israel? Because the trees up there were better. And the bottom line for Solomon, he's setting up a business deal. 
Another reason to build the temple in Jerusalem at this point was that uh, Solomon has rest. As Solomon explains, he has given him rest on every side. There's no adversaries or disasters implying that he had the time to build it. Instead of being focused on all these other things, I can focus on building the temple right now. Uh, the Hebrew term that is used here, rest, means uh, it's different than the, the term Sabbath or uh, shalom, as it means settling down quietly to enjoy a peaceful situation away from a political threat. So it's a different kind of word and connotation here. The noun of this root word uh, means a peace of mind or soul from all fears. Uh, and so Solomon showed that all the adversaries against his kingdom have been crushed. But they're, they're no more. They're not going to come and uh, you know, rear its ugly head against him. And the, the Hebrew word for adversary here is used to refer to anyone who's doing wickedly uh, and of evil things. So Solomon can't envision any possible disaster right now. Um, you know, so, so from any political attack um, in the immediate future surrounding the, the, the places, all is controlled by the Lord. So he's in a good spot. Peace is everywhere. And so he attributes this sense of rest to the Lord because the Lord had granted it. And thus the peaceful situation is a divine signal to move forward with the plans to build the temple. So when's the best time to do it? Do it right now. Um, and then thirdly, um, it's the right time. So Solomon says um, that it's the time to begin the work. I intended, therefore, to build the temple uh, in the name of the Lord God as the Lord had told my father David, as verse 5 mentioned. So um, it's referring both to Deuteronomy and also 2 Samuel which talks about this. The words, the temple for the name of the Lord, echoes uh, from Deuteronomy 12, 11, a dwelling place for his name. And then the phrase, to build a temple, echoes the words uh, of the Lord to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13, to build a house for my name. So you see both references are, um, are placed here. In addition to that, uh, we see how Solomon quotes what um, God said to David through Nathan, the prophet, as you remember. says, your son in whom I will put on the throne in your place will build the temple for my name. So you see the consistency. It's for the name of the Lord, why they're doing it. So building the temple uh, was the fulfillment of the prophecy given to David uh, back in 2 Samuel 7. And so Solomon's obeying the divine command. And using the word name here, uh, Solomon's referring to the, the personality and, and the name of Yahweh. So when you look at the word Lord there, that's what the word comes up as, Yahweh. Uh, it's the, the claims that Yahweh is the God of his father, David, as well as his own God. And quite often, the name of a deity reveals the character or the function of that particular deity. So the name Yahweh uh, means, I am who I am as Exodus 3.14 says. It's the personal name for God, which is holy. So the people of Israel also used another term, Adonai, um, which means my Lord. So in the place of Yahweh, out of respect. And so Adonai, Yahweh, was the God of Abraham and of Jacob, uh, the, the God of promise and blessing uh, that sets the Israelites free from their long bondage. Uh, Solomon knew that the, the past histories of Israelites, uh, and, he, and yet he wants to build a temple where the name of the Lord, uh, Yahweh, and Adonai will abide forever. And then we see the, the quest for timber in, in verse 6 there. So, and the reason for stating the, the re, uh, building the temple is he's, he orders Haram to cut down the necessary trees entire. And so the phrase give orders here means that he commanded Haran to, to supply the, the wood. Uh, the cedars of Lebanon were famous, kind of like what we call the redwood trees uh, that we would have in, say, California. So there's certain places that are known for certain things, um, um, you know, and so the cedars of Lebanon are famous. Uh, the cedars of Lebanon can grow about 100 feet tall um, because of the suitable soil and climate. Um, and so the cedar wood is strong, uh, good for polishing as well. And Solomon offers incentive for supplying the particular timber. Uh, so he's going to offer the manpower, 
um, from his kingdom to work alongside the labors of Haram. Uh, since his men lack the skills to cut the tree down, we want to come alongside to help you. And then secondly, he, he wants to pay the wages of the laborers set by Haram. So Solomon wanted what was best for the house of the Lord, and he was willing to use even Gentile help, if you will, to assist in the work. So they didn't have to be the Jews or people from Israel. Just like if we have a building today, uh, most likely the contractors are not all going to be Christian. Sometimes they're Christian, sometimes they're not Christian, but you're going to use the best help to build the house or to build the temple or the building. And um, there's a great lesson here on God's timing. The, the lesson about the plans of God and, and following God's timing uh, is not our timing. So we have to make sure we're, we're right in step with God's perfect timing. And though I like the idea behind the thought that we can do, we, we, can, we can do anything with God's help, but the truth is there are some things that are not going to be in God's timing or God's plan. But, um, you know, so, so we need to make sure uh, that we're doing exactly what he wants us to do. Uh, there are some things that are just plain wrong timing, right idea, but wrong timing. Uh, some things are good, like building a temple, uh, and, and sometimes God wants someone else to do that, and not you. So even though you have a desire to do it, but yet someone else might be called to do it. And, and in the case here, so David had a heart for the temple to build the temple, but yet he wasn't the one to do it. It wasn't his timing. It was God's timing for Solomon to do it. Now, Lebanon, that uh, is mentioned here. Again, that's uh, um, that's the first clue that the king of Tyre is controlled of what is uh, Lebanon. And the point is that Solomon was asking this king to have the cut, trees cut down in a very forested area called Sidon. Uh, Solomon tells his king, in effect, that Sidon has these lumberjacks uh, that are good for cutting down those trees. And so Solomon wanted to pay the, the king whatever the cost was in cutting down those trees. And notice, though, how Solomon kind of butters up this king. First he says, uh, name your wages, which means he's asking the king, name your price and I'll pay it. And then he gives the compliment, your lumberjacks are so good, you know, no one could cut down these trees like your guys. And um, one more other thing about these trees, these cedar trees, the, the wood is very bitter and also, um, and, and therefore the, the insects don't like them. So you're not going to be infested with the insect problems there or termites to come in to eat it up. And that means that this type of wood would last a long time. And that's why the cedar wood uh, cabin tree is very popular in a lot of expensive homes. Uh, kind of like what we um, also use oak these days or other types of wood uh, that uh, lasts long and is strong. Now that you know about cedar wood, it's time to move on. Verse 7. And so it was when Haram heard these words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and says, Blessed be the Lord this day, for he has given David a wise son over his, this great people. And then Haram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the message which you sent me, and I will do all that you desire concerning the cedar and the cypress logs. My servant shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea, I'll float them on rafts by the sea to the place that you indicate to me, and I will have them broken apart there. And then you will take them away, and you shall fulfill my desire by giving food for my house. And then Haram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. Now, keep in mind that Solomon and the king of Tyre are communicating back and forth with these messengers. And so when the king of Tyre heard about this business proposition, uh, he said, in effect, hey, that's a good deal. I'll have the lumberjacks, you know, um, living near the forest, cut down those trees. I'll get those trees by floating them on these particular rafts, uh, made from those trees, by the way, uh, down the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and my fee for the service that you provide food for me and those who are in my palace. So that's, that was the business deal. Now, didn't Solomon have to pay the lumberjacks? Of course he did. But the king of Tyre here, he's focused on his profit from the business deal, and his profit would be that Solomon had to provide food for the king. And so remember that the Israelites were, were mostly farmers. Uh, so not only did they raise animals, but they also grew wheat, uh, for bread. 
And the, the king was saying, hey, give me some of that wheat for my house. Uh, and that's my fee for providing you with these cedar trees. An important point to also consider is um, I don't think that the king of Tyre really cared about the God of Israel as much as he saw profit, um, you know, as a motive here. So that was probably his underlining uh, idea here. Instead of, hey, I, I want to know more about, you know, the God of Israel. No, he's, he's more focused on his profit. So Tyre was a powerful nation uh, in that part of the world for many centuries by trade. And unlike Egypt, or even under um, Israel under David, uh, Tyre didn't become a powerful by conquering. Uh, they just became uh, just trading with other countries. So that's how they became powerful. Uh, and I suspect this king really, like we said, had no interest in the king of Israel um, is it other than just the, this business deal. It was just what's in it for him. It's all politics anyways. And so as we see here, Haram was very enthusiastic about the work that Solomon wanted to do. He understood uh, that the God of Israel, who he was, and, and please understand this was not an easy task for all this. And as mentioned, uh, that these cutting these logs down uh, in Tyre meant these logs would float down the Mediterranean Sea. From Tyre to Joppa was about 50 miles or about 80 kilometers. So it wasn't just a, a quick little turnaround. It was some distance there. Um, and it was really the, the only port there in Israel at, at this particular time that they used this for. And Joppa would then transport it another 40 miles or 65 kilometers into Jerusalem. So, and it wasn't an easy trail. Uh, it, it took a bit. They didn't have the freeways like they have today. So, not an easy task, um, but uh, they did it. Verse 11 goes on to say, So Solomon gave Haram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household, 20 cores pressed oil. And thus Solomon gave to Haram year by year. So Sol the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised, and there would be peace between Haram and Solomon, and the two made a treaty together. So in return for the skilled labor and the trees in Lebanon, Solomon sent Haram uh, this 20,000 cores of wheat, which is 130,000 bushels uh, per year. Uh, so 20 cores of pressed oil, uh, which equals to between uh, 1,200 to 1,700 gallons, which is uh, 4,000, you know, 500 to 5,000 plus liters of uh, olive oil. So it's a, a bit of uh, oil there, uh, olive oil, each year. A liquid core is about uh, 60 to 85 gallons, which is 200 uh, to 300 um, liters. So that's when you start to break down how much would that be. Now, as you read 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 10, there seems to be a discrepancy of what is given by Solomon, though. We're told that, indeed, I will give you your servants, woodsmen, who cut the timber, 20,000 cores of gray uh, to the ground uh, wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of oil. Why the difference? Well, in 1 Kings, um, Solomon gave to Haram, uh, king of Tyre, and here in, in the Second Chronicles um, is what Solomon gave to the workers and what they were doing. So, uh, so there's where sometimes there's a discrepancy between the passage, but one is he's dealing with the king of Tyre, the other he's given to uh, the workers. So there is no discrepancy when you start to look at that. Verse 13, then King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all of Israel. The labor force was 30,000 men, and he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in shifts. And they went one month in Lebanon, two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the labor force. So here we see uh, he's gathering the workforce to go to Lebanon to assist with the cutting down. You have 30,000 uh, that worked in shifts. Ten uh, would work at one time, and then they would have two months off. Uh, and they would just kind of rotate this. Uh, he placed Adoniram in charge of this labor force, uh, as we also saw back in uh, um, chapter 4, that who his uh, administration cabinet would be. Now, Solomon realized he could not do all this, and uh, so he was able to, again, delegate uh, the work out, which was a wise thing to do. Many hands make light work, as it's been said. And, and, and that's the way it is in the body of Christ, working together, as we'll see in a moment. Verse 15, 
Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens, 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains, besides 3,300 from the, the uh, chiefs of uh, Solomon's deputies who supervised uh, people who labored in the work. And the king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones, hewn stones, and lay the foundation of the temple. And so Solomon's builders, Haram's builders, and the Gebelites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. So Solomon is gathering all this workforce in Israel to cut, to carry the stones to the temple. These stones were used to build the temple. It was cut actually away from the temple site. Uh, so uh, Solomon's quarry uh, brought the temple and, and, and placed it in the proper position. So wherever they were, they were cut outside, and they just brought them to uh, the temple area to, for the building of it. And they did this with such accuracy. In, um, in fact, in Herod's temple, um, you can't even insert a, a, a knife or a credit card between the stones. It was that precise in how they built these things. And the stones were some uh, 37 feet long, 5 feet high, um, 8 feet thick, weighing some 80 to 100 tons. That's great workmanship and how they constructed this from what uh, some sources say. And this is Solomon's labor force in Israel. And notice how they would kind of relate to us as Christians in the labor force. The 70,000 laborers who carried the burdens. How does that relate to us as Christians? Well, you might call them kind of the intercessors for the body of Christ. Those are the ones who are the, the prayer warriors, the ones who are leading others to Christ. They're the ones out there doing the work, um, you know, serving in all kinds of different areas. Uh, then there's the 80,000 that cut the stone. How does that relate to us? Well, you might say this speaks of those who are teachers or, or, or shaping the living stones into uh, building the temple. So this is done through Bible study. It's done through small group, uh, Sunday school, and so on. And then you have the 3,300 foremen. Uh, so these might be your, your pastors and elders and deacons, uh, uh, those who oversee the work. And that's kind of what their job was to oversee the work there, uh, those shepherding the flock of God. So, so we see all these uh, potential developments that you can kind of uh, analyze and you can see that the work being done. And uh, the, the cutting away and the chiseling in our lives, it, it's how God shapes us and molds us uh, to, to make us fit into his dwelling place, the heavenly temple of God. So you can see there's a, a great illustration, word picture here. And um, regarding this work, I like what Spurgeon once wrote. He says, we have been great subjects or subjects of the great deal of secret and unseen underground work the Lord has spent uh, upon us a, a world of care. My brother, that you would unveil those great searching of your heart which you have been the subject. You have been honored in public, and if so, you have many whippings. Behind the door, at least you should glory in your flesh. All those chastenings, humblings, and searching of your heart have been in private, laying the foundations for higher things. And so there's a work that you see publicly, but there's a work that happens privately. You know, and that's kind of like the cutting of the stone, the shaping, all that, so that way when it's displayed, it's good. So God's working on us down here so that we can fit up there. And so the amazing thing is that, um, you know, God's doing a work in all of our lives. Uh, just as all these workers, God was doing a work through them. I uh, like what Paul says in Hebrews uh, 2.11, says, Both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one, uh, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So, He's working in our lives. He's sanctifying. He's setting apart for, um, you know, for his glory. And notice that one day it, that work is going to be complete. One day, and in fact we'll find out in the next chapter, it took seven years to build the temple. But just the, there's, a, there's a completion to the work. He's going to complete the work that which he has begun in us. And that's happened when we go in glory. So there's a lot of cutting, a lot of chiseling, but he will finish the work, and it will be a masterpiece because the master did the work through us. Now we come to chapter 6, and we see uh, Solomon's building the temple. 
And it came to pass, on verse 1, uh, 480th year of the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziv, which I think is like March, April time, uh, which is the second month, and he began to build the house of the Lord. So from this verse, you can um, see how Solomon began the work um, of the temple. And we know that the division of the kingdom and the death of Solomon can be dated around 930 B.C. Solomon reigned about 40 years, and so the, to- uh, the temple started on the fourth year of his reign. So that would mean that he would begin the work around April, May of uh, 966 B.C., uh, when the place of Exodus around 446 B.C. or, or 480 years earlier. So that was the time frame that you're considering here. And remember that the temple was built on the threshing floor of Aruna, uh, on Mount Moriah. Uh, and this is recorded in 2 Samuel 24. Now, how did Solomon know what to build, how to build it, what did it look like? Because he, he just told he's going to build a temple. Where we're told in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 11 and 12, it says, Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule and its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, the inner chambers, and the place of mercy seat, the plans for all that he had by the Spirit, uh, the court of the house of the Lord for the chambers of all around, the treasuries of his house of God, and the treasuries for the dedicated thing. So in other words, David gave um, God gave David the plans to build the temple, and David gave those plans to Solomon. So that's how it happened. Um, and how cool is that? You know, you don't come up with this on your own, Solomon. You know, David, you know, your dad, he gave you all the blueprints for it. He gave you all the details that you need. It, we just need someone to execute it. Verse 2 goes on to say, Now the house which the King Solomon built for the Lord is a lengthy uh, 60 cubits, and its width 20, and the height of 30 cubits. So that's 90 feet uh, long, uh, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. So it's smaller than the basketball court out here. So, so that's the size of the temple that we're talking about when you sort of put those in numbers. Uh, so it's not massive, huge that we're thinking, but uh, it would fit in the basketball court where we meet on Sunday morning. So the vestibule in front of the sanctuary of the house was 20 cubits or 30 feet wide uh, along uh, across the the width in the house. The width of the vestibule extended 10 cubits or 15 feet uh, from the front of the house. So again, uh, a basketball court is about 90 feet long and uh, I want to say it's 49 across is the the length of a kind of a basketball court. The length of the kind of like where you do the free throw from the line um, that's about 15 feet. So when we talk about the, the cherub, um, that's 15 feet. You know, So we're talking about that's the size of uh, the wingspan. So as you see, the temple um, was a good size. Um, and again, I, I don't have the exact measurements of comparing that to the tabernacle. Um, but uh, I think some have said it's, it's, it's bigger than the tabernacle. Um, and to give you an idea how big um, Solomon's temple was, a cubit is roughly 18 inches. So whenever we see cubits and, and measurement in the Bible, it's 18 inches. So it's the, the, the elbow to like the index finger or whatever the, the longest part is. Depends on someone's hand, you know. So that's roughly 18 inches. And that would make uh, the temple pretty large there, you know. Um, so 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, 45 feet high. Um, so I don't know how high it is from the ceiling there. I'm not sure if it's quite 45 feet. Um, but the temple also had an extension, a porch in front of it, and this porch was uh, 30 feet wide and 15 feet long. Um, so you see it's, it's a good size there, but it would fit like right there. Verse 4 goes on to say, And he made the house and the windows of uh, uh, with beleveled flames. And against the wall of uh, the temple, he built chambers around it, against the walls of the temple, all around the sanctuary and the inner sanctuary, and thus he made uh, uh, cha- side chambers around it. The lowest chamber was five cubits, or seven and a half feet wide. The middle was six cubits, or nine feet. The third was seven cubits, or ten and a half feet. 
and made narrow ledges around the outside of the temple so that it supported the beams uh, would not be fastened to the wall of the temple. Now, again, keep in mind that the tabernacle didn't have windows. Um, the only light source was the, uh, the menorah, the, the seven-branched uh, uh, you know, oil-burning lamp there. And so that was the only thing that lit uh, the holy place as it uh, uh, stood on the uh, left side of the opening of the Holy of Holies. So this menorah, or the seven-branched oil lamp, pointed to Christ. As Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches as well. So you can see how it's all coming uh, from Christ. And so this menorah had that central staff connected to it with the other branches. So those six branches represent man, uh, and the, um, the only one that's complete that we're attached to is Christ, uh, the main branch that's in the middle. And so the Holy of Holies was, uh, had no artificial lamp or light uh, in the tabernacle, but it was lit for the glory, from the glory in the presence of God. Now, what I want you to notice is that um, the temple did allow uh, a little light to come through those narrow windows. Uh, it's not much light, but uh, there was a bit that came through there. So the tabernacle was the light of God that was dependent upon, and here we see a small amount of natural light being allowed into this temple. So Solomon's temple was awesome in its structure, um, but it didn't represent Christ as the tabernacle did. So uh, when we look at things in the, the New Testament, it's always talking about the, um, the symbolisms of the, the tabernacle, not necessarily of the temple, uh, the illustrations and the typologies and all those sort of things. But as you study the tabernacle, you see that every piece of furniture and coverings all point to Christ. Uh, but we don't have that same illustration um, used in the, the temple. So how does this kind of relate to us today? Well, there are many churches today that allow the light of the world uh, to light their churches. Um, you know, and I'm not trying to hyper-spiritualize this temple or anything like that. Uh, but they, they let the, the, the world sometimes fill, um, you know, the temple, the churches. They're trying to mimic the things of the world, uh, the world programs. Uh, the insights don't compare to the light of God or the word of God. So you see there's the compromises there. And if these churches continue down this particular road, uh, the glory of God will depart from their presence. And so, um, so if you take away God's word, you, you've taken away God. You know, because, you know, he, he holds his uh, word above his name, as it says in Psalm uh, 118 or 138 or one of those two. I can't remember. Um, but you see he, he, the value and the importance of the word of God. But remember what Jesus says in John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So all around this temple, there was these chambers, three floors of storage areas um, and, and living areas for the priest. Uh, so this was a massive project uh, when it was complete. Nothing compared to it. Um, and um, when all was said and done, this entire structure was around 110 feet long and about 75 feet wide. Uh, verse 7 goes on to say, The temple, when it was being built, was built with the stone furnished at the quarry, and no hammer or chisel or iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. So all the stones from Solomon's temple were cut away uh, from the temple site, like we mentioned. Uh, and you can go to uh, and see Solomon's quarry today. It's located under Jerusalem between the Damascus Gate and Herod's Gate. Um, and so Solomon's quarry is also known as uh, Zedekiah's Cave. So as you go to the temple um, wall there, the um, wailing wall to the left is where this uh, is taking place. Uh, and it runs about five city blocks underneath the uh, Muslim Quarter um, and the old city of Jerusalem. The entrance to Solomon's quarries is just beneath the, the old city wall between uh, Damascus Gate and Herod's Gate, as we said. And so this area is filled with limestone that was used at the construction of the temple. And uh, to get those stones out, they would drill holes into these limestones, pack the holes with sticks. 
Uh, then they would pour water over the sticks and then it would kind of uh, this expanding process with these limestones to crack and then they would be able to move it. So they had their method and ways because they didn't have all the tools and technology like we have today. So these stones would be chiseled down to the exact size and number to where they would go in the temple. Uh, they would fit perfectly, so they didn't need any other um, stuff to, to fill the cracks or uh, the mortars and whatnot. And so these stones were interlocking. Uh, the stones dried in the sun uh, as it would harden them. And uh, we see some of the foundation stones of Solomon's temple today. Uh, the stones are so light that you can even put a, a knife blade between them, as, uh, you know, as it's been said. And again, this is a picture of what God's doing in each of us. You know, he's working on us, you know, molding us, shaping us, chiseling us to get us to the, the, the right, uh, you know, uh, place. Verse 8 goes on to say, The doorway of the middle story was the right side of the temple. They went up by the stairs in the middle of the story and from the middle to the third. And so he built the temple and finished it. And he paneled the temple with beams and the borders of cedar. And he built the chambers against the entire temple. And five cubits high, they were attached to the temple with cedar beams. So the side chambers were mentioned before. Uh, they're located on the north, south, and west sides of the temple. Um, and they're built these three stories. Um, and so the side chambers were used for storing things. And as we said, the priests uh, were, were living there uh, when they served the temple. Verse 11, then the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, concerning this temple which uh, you are building, if you walk in my statues, execute my judgments, keep all my commands and walk in them, then I'll perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake uh, my people Israel. So Solomon built the temple and finished it. So Solomon's building the Lord his temple. So why does the Lord tell Solomon uh, that he needs to continue to walk after the Lord, to follow after him, and, um, and then only uh, to, to be with him? Well, just because Solomon's doing this outside work, you might say, doesn't mean that his heart is right with the Lord. Uh, so he needs to stay close to the Lord and not do the work without that relationship. It's so important to have that relationship with the Lord when you're serving him. And we'll see that as much as God desires to dwell with the children of Israel, because um, they didn't walk in all his ways, his glory will not depart from uh, the temple. And so, so the warning is simple. Uh, don't go through the motion without the emotion. You know, so uh, don't do the work without drawing close to the Lord, uh, without drawing that deep relationship with Him. Why are you doing this in the first place? Uh, it comes back down to that fundamental question. Uh, why, are, you know, just, you know, being diligent with the work that He's called us to do. And uh, don't just go part way and stop before the work is done, you know. So we need to have that commitment, that um, uh, focus, that motivation there. And there are many that uh, are excited to get involved in the work, but then the work, when it becomes work and it gets tough, they drop out. They don't finish. Uh, they make uh, spiritual excuses. Uh, I don't feel led to do this anymore. Or it looks like God has closed the door. Or I'm involved in other things. And a whole host of other uh, excuses that can come up. Uh, the excuses can go on like that. And I said they can be very um, sounding strong spiritually. Uh, but if God told you to start a work and to be involved in that work, he's not going to leave it unfinished. Um, he, he wants to complete that work that has begun. There's times and seasons. Uh, don't get me wrong in that. But, um, you know... Uh, a lot of people, when, the, when it gets tough, when it gets hard, people just decide to quit instead of pressing through and working through it, being resilient. Uh, verse 15, And he built the inside walls from the temple with cedar boards from the floor of the temple to the ceiling. He paneled the inside wood, covered the floor of the temple with planks of cypress. And then he built 20 cubit room at the rear of the temple from the floor to the ceiling with cedar boards and built it inside the inner sanctuary as the most holy place. So here we see all the dimensions of the Holy of Holies and the temple, twice as big as the tabernacle when it comes down to the measurement of it all. The Holy of Holies was about a 30-foot cubed structure. 
uh, as we'll see. And it's a place where the Ark of the Covenant uh, was kept, uh, the mercy seat that covered this box where the commandments of God were kept, and God dwelt above the mercy seat. Verse 17 continues on and says, <clears throat> In the front of the temple sanctuary was 40 cubits long. Inside the temple was cedar, carved ornament buds and open flowers. All is cedar and no stone to be seen. So direct in front of the Holy of Holies, uh, the holy place, was separ separated by the veil. And so the holy place was a 60 foot long by 30 feet wide. So right in the middle, um, next to the, the veil, was this altar of incense. So when you start to unpack and you start to look through all these, you have these uh, other areas around it. And right uh, uh, to, the, to the right of the altar of incense was the table of showbread. So uh, Solomon's temple, there was... Uh, not just like the, the tabernacle, but there's 10 of them on the left side and seven uh, branched olive uh, lamp. I, again, uh, Solomon made 10 of them. So it wasn't just one, it was multiple. And uh, all that's located in the holy place, as we'll see, five of these were to the right, five to the left. Uh, and so while in the tabernacle, the lamp uh, was to the left and the showbread was to the right. So when you look at the two different examples. Verse 19 goes on to say, So he prepared the inner sanctuary um, inside the temple to set the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, 20 cubits high. And he overlaid it with pure gold and overlaid the altar uh, of cedar. So Solomon overlaid the inside of the temple with pure gold. He stretched gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary. He overlaid it with gold. The whole temple he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the temple and he had overlaid the gold entire uh, altar that was by the inner sanctuary. And um, notice that all this beautiful wood is covered with gold, pure gold. And, and we're told in, in, in the scriptures that Solomon used about 100,000 talents of gold or some um, uh, 3,750 uh, tons, if you will, equals our day. So it was around 45 to $50 billion uh, of uh, how much this cost. Uh, and not only that, but in regards to the silver, uh, he used over uh, a million talents of silver or gain. Uh, and again, that's about... Um, um, 37,000 plus um, tons of silver, which equals it to over almost $11 billion today uh, when it comes down to the equivalency. And plus you were to add all the wood, the precious stones that cost uh, up to uh, over, you know, close to $60 billion with all the extra stuff there. So it was an impressive structure. Um, but Solomon wanted nothing cheap. This was for the Lord. Verse 23, so the inner sanctuary became two cherub of uh, olive wood, uh, each ten cubits high. Uh, one wing, wing of the cherub was five cubits. The other wing of the cherub was five cubits. Then ten cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. And the other cherub was ten cubits. Both cherub were the same size and shape. And the height of one cherub was ten cubits, and so was the other cherub. Then he sent the cherub uh, inside the inner room, and it stretched out the wing of the cherub. The wing from one uh, touched the in one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall. And so the wings touched each other in the middle of the room, and so he also laid the cherub with gold. So as you see this, and again, this is a massive structure, uh, but here we see that the two cherub mentioned are not the ones that are overseeing the Ark of the Covenant, uh, but these are inside the Holy of Holies. In fact, they're, they're facing toward the entrance uh, of the room, and they're spreading the rings so that one's touching the, the other side of the room, and the other wings touching the other side of the room, and, and then the inside wings touched each other. So when the high priest entered the room, they would see this massive cherub, uh, that stood 15 feet high, and their wingspan of 15 feet. So it was pretty massive, uh, and impressive. I mean, it just for, it, it puts the fear of God in you when you're seeing this structure, how massive, how amazing it is. Uh, verse 29, Then he carved all the wells of the temple around, both inner and outer sanctuaries, carved the fi uh, figures of the cherubim, the palm trees, and open flowers. And the floor of the temple overlaid with gold, both inner and outer sanctuaries, 
For the entrance and the inner sanctuary he made doors of olive wood and lentil and the wood posts and one-fifth of the wall, the two doors of the olive wood, and they carved them figures of the cherubim, uh, palm trees, open flowers, and laid them with gold and spread gold on the cherubim and the, the palm trees. So the f- door of the sanctuary, he also made the doorpost of olive wood, one-fourth of the wall. And the two doors were of cypress wood, two panels comprising uh, one folding door, two panels comprising the other folding door. And then he carved the cherubim, palm trees, the open flowers on them, and overlaid them with gold applied evenly on the carved work. And uh, he built the inner court with three rows, hewn stone, and a row of cedar beams. And the fourth year of the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. And the eleventh year in the month of Ziv, uh, or in the month of Bull, which is like November time, which is the eighth month, the house was uh, finished uh, in all its details according to its plans, and so it was seven years in the building. So you can see all the intricacies of this amazing temple, how amazing it is, the detail of it all. And it took him seven years to complete this. Uh, awesome structure. And um, it, it's easy for Israel to focus on the temple of God instead of uh, the God of the temple. And so it's, it comes down to a focus there. And yet without continued faithfulness to God, uh, the temple's glory quickly faded. So the, this glorious temple was again plundered just five years after Solomon died as uh, 1 Kings chapter 14 mentions. So a lot of hard work, seven years, and then five years after it gets destroyed. Now, at that time, and um, even uh, for modern times, and when Jesus was um, walking the face of this earth, um, it was required for all the Jews to go to Jerusalem. And, um, and, and can you imagine climbing up, um, you know, to Jerusalem as you get closer to the temple and you see uh, the amazing structure, but they're also singing the songs of ascent, uh, Psalm uh, 120 to 134, uh, these, you know, songs of ascent, uh, as it's been called, because uh, as they're making the pilgrimage, you're going up to Jerusalem. So no matter where you're at in Israel, you go up to Jerusalem because it's higher in elevation. But as we know, all the uh, adult males were required to go uh, three main feasts of the year. Spring uh, was the Passover. Uh, summer was the uh, Pentecost. And then I think um, in the fall was the Feast of Tabernacles when you spread it out. Of course, they can go to other times and other feasts there. But those are the three ones that are required. Um, but amazing to see uh, the structure there as they're going there worshiping just that um, overwhelming emotional experience to, you know, um, the, this new building that you see in Jerusalem as they're going to, to worship the Lord. And, and um, you know, just like sometimes when you see the, the new uh, skyscrapers, it's amazing how massive they are, how expensive they are, uh, but nothing compared to how expensive this, this temple would have been. Um, but um, for, for the, those living at the time, you can just sense the joy uh, as they're climbing up, as the, you know, they, they see the temple in the distance. I remember, um, you know, it wasn't because we saw the temple there, but um, uh, when we did our tour um, uh, to Israel, uh, and when you come up to Jerusalem, we, we did a stop overlooking the whole city, and of course you're looking you know, at the Dome of the Rock, you know, the, the Temple Mount area. But it was still an amazing, beautiful sight uh, when you see that. Um, and as great as Herod's temple was at that time with Jesus, it didn't compare to Solomon's temple. So Solomon's temple was off the chart. It was spectacular, um, you know, to, to see. So, so chapter 5 and 6. And so it's time to lay down our building tools and... Uh, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy and all these intricate details. Uh, we're amazed of uh, you are a detailed God and uh, uh, you complete the work that you have begun. And so we thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives 
in the work that you're doing in this church. We pray that you continue to fill us with your spirit, that you continue to lead us, guide us, direct us. And we pray for just the anointing to, to do the work that you've called us to do, uh, to be witnesses, to be servants um, in our homes, in our workplaces, and in this church. So we thank you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.